Today I'm going to show you how to design your own coloring sheets. This is something that I've been doing on the channel for a while. And if you're one of my fantastic patrons, you guys get access to most of the coloring sheets that I create absolutely free as part of your Patreon membership. So the main materials we're going to be focusing on using today are cardstock and pigment liners. Now you can use any kind of pigment liners you like. It can be the Copic Multi Liners. It just needs to be a lining pin, um, a felt liner or a brush pin that is going to be waterproof or alcohol marker proof. So for today's tutorial, I'm going to be using the Sakura Microns. And the main reason I'm using these for this tutorial today is because this is what we're going to be using in Art Squad tomorrow. But generally when I do line arts, I like to use brush pins. And I wanna show you guys a couple of examples and talk about the main differences between fine liners, felt tip liners, fixed width liners like these, and brush pins. So I have here three semi-recent to recent examples of my line art. Two of them are going to be for alcohol marker tutorials, and then one of them is going to be for a watercolor tutorial. So this one was done with Tombow Furinosuke brush pins. It allows us to use a variety of colors so we can create a colored line art. And I think I've talked about that a few times here on the channel, but basically what's great about a colored line art is that it kind of blends in with the colors you're already applying. So the goal with creating a colored line art is to kind of figure out what colors you're gonna want, which I have here, my notes for that on this post-it note, and use a similar color for that with your colored line art. You can also use a contrasting color for this, and this keeps your finished artwork bright, vibrant, and bouncy. I'll show you guys an example of that in a minute. Here is another example of colored line art. So I'm going to scan these soon and have these up on Patreon and I hope to color for the color these for y'all soon too. And then this would be an example of a black and white ink line art. So you guys see these pretty commonly with my watercolor tutorials. With this, you've already got your darkest color already on the page. That's the black ink. And it can have a tendency to deaden your art depending on how you handle it. So when I'm working with really bright, saturated colors like alcohol markers, I really like doing colored line arts. And then when I'm working with something that can kind of handle the black ink on the page, like watercolor, I go ahead and I use black ink for that. So here's an example of an illustration that was inked with colored line art and then colored with alcohol markers. This was my Valentine's Day illustration from this year. So you guys can see, we still have a lot of really bright, saturated, fun colors. Sometimes black ink has a tendency to deaden the colors that it's used with, particularly with lighter colors, and that's when colored inks can be really, really helpful. Here's a watercolor illustration that started out as a lineless watercolor illustration. It was sketched with red lead and then painted, and then I went ahead and I inked it afterwards. And in some areas, I used the watercolor itself to kind of ink the illustration, and then in some areas, I used colored inks to ink the illustration. And here's an example of an illustration that was inked first with black ink and then watercolored on top of it. And then in some areas, I went ahead and I re-inked it just so that we have that contrast and that clarity. Generally, when I'm inking an illustration for color or for watercolor, I use a few very specific brush pins that you guys hear me reference over and over and over again. Here we have the Tombow Furinosuke brush pins. So these are manufactured by Tombow. They have a small brush tip that's fairly firm. You can get really, really thin lines and you can get much thicker lines. It really depends on how much pressure you put when you're inking. So if you want those thicker lines, you're gonna really kind of bear down with this. I really like these. They are waterproof, they're alcohol marker safe as well. And they are what I use for these kinds of illustrations. For my black and white illustrations, I typically like to use the Sakura Pigma FB. Similar size, it isn't quite as firm as these. So if you find that you're heavy handed, you tend to bear down a lot and you have some of that brush control, a way to work on that is to use brush pins and to practice it. But if you're still not fully confident in that, using these firmer brush tips is a great way to kind of build up that control. Now, if you're looking to ink or line something larger, you do have some other options. So. These are the Akashia Thin Line brush pins. These are in muted colors. I did a review of these a while back and they are teeny tiny 
alcohol marker and water safe brush pins with individual nylon hairs. So these are a lot of fun to ink with and that watercolor illustration of Kara with the cherry blossoms that you guys just saw, I use these to ink that. And then these are the Kuratake Cambio Tambien. These are much larger. These are colored pigment based. And I have a field test where I show you guys how I use these to ink and then watercolor on top of it. And if you're looking for a good black and white option, Pentel makes the Pentel pigment brush pins, which you guys have probably seen a lot on the channel, especially when I'm doing my Lilliputian living inks. I really, really like those as well. And they're fairly easy to find. But today we're also going to be focusing on fixed width. So this means that every time you draw a line, it's gonna be about the same size. You can really bear down and ruin the nib and make it a larger size or you can try to be light-handed and get a smaller size, but in general, these come in the size they come in, and they are available in a wide range of sizes from super teeny tiny 005 to, you know, you can even get the calligraphy ones that are three millimeters wide that I like to use for comic panels. So we're gonna be focusing on these and these today. So generally, when I'm creating line art and I'm inking for markers specifically, I like to use Strathmore Bristol, but cardstock which is very inexpensive you can find it at almost any store from walmart to staples to even michael's cardstock is a great alternative that works well with alcohol markers you can buy it by the ream and is very inexpensive compared to bristol so if you can't afford bristol or you're looking for something that's a little bit more economical while you kind of figure out how you want to handle your art supplies cardstock is a great option this is a brand new pack of five Sakura multi-liners. Sakura uses their pigment color technology, and that is a pigment-based formula. So once you've allowed it to dry fully, it's archival, it's going to be waterproof, and it's going to be alcohol marker safe, which makes it a great option. One of the reasons I went with Microns is you can find Microns almost everywhere. You can get them at Walmart, you can get them at Michael's. So even if you don't have an art supply store in your area, you should be able to find these. You can also find them online. In fact, I had ordered a larger pack of these for my class and those hadn't come in. So I had to hit Michael's to get this pack. And this is their multi-color pack. So you can see the colors at the top. So you can also see them at the bottom. They also come in multi-size packs. It really kind of depends on what you're looking for. Now, 0.45 millimeter, almost five millimeter, or almost 0.5 meter, millimeter is a good kind of middle ground size while you figure out what works for you. And um, generally when I'm inking, I draw a little bit larger for this sort of stuff. So I would lean to five and eight, but if you draw smaller or if you want a bunch of really, really fine lines, you're gonna wanna go with maybe the 05, the one, the, or the two. So this pack came with some pretty basic colors. We have a green, a black, a purple, a brown, a blue, and a red. Pink is also a very useful color, particularly if you're inking lighter skin tones. If I'm inking darker skin tones, I like to use a red and a purple combined. So it's really about figuring out your local color and then your shadow color and combining the two. I think I have some tutorials here on the channel where I talk about that more in depth, but I'm happy to go happy to give you guys a pretty basic demonstration. So I'm going to start with my fairly large collection of Tombow Furunosuke. I did not buy them all at one time. I kind of bought the colors I needed as I needed them. That can be more expensive in the long run if you end up amassing a huge collection, but it also helps prevent you from buying art supplies you don't necessarily need and won't ever use. You can get a 12 pack of the basic colors as well as the new neon colors, or you can get them open stock over on Blick. So I'll have links for all the supplies that I mentioned here in the description below. Unfortunately, I don't think you can find these at Walmart, but you can find them at Michael's, at least in the sets, and you might be able to find them open stock at Michael's as well. So I am going to grab a blue from each. Keep in mind, these are made by two different companies. Sakura does make brush microns. In fact, Sakura also makes the pigmas that I really like. Um, I actually don't really like the brush microns. I find that they're prone to fraying and they get damaged really quickly. I'm heavy handed, so I happen to like brush nibs that have a lot of flexibility and a lot of give. So unfortunately for me, 
microns and pit pins are not always the best fits. So this is what, give me a sec, I'll make it focus for y'all. This is what the brush looks like on the Tombow Funenosuke. You can see it has the harder tip. It is water-based and it has pigment ink. Don't worry though, once you've let it dry fully, it is going to be waterproof as well. And then this is the tip on the Micron. You can see what I mean when I say it is a fixed width nib. It has a metal collar to protect the really small plastic or fiber tip at the top. If you bear down too hard, you can ruin these. You can basically just push them back up into the barrel. Now these are not designed to be refillable. Copic used to make the metal body multi-lighters that were refillable, but frankly, those weren't as eco-savvy as you might hope because they still use a plastic, like a large plastic cartridge that actually went into the barrel. So, you know, if that's a concern for you, these do last a long time. Um, you're not going to use them up immediately unless you're using a super tiny one to fill in larger areas. If you wanna fill in larger areas, well, A, I would recommend switching to either watercolor or an alcohol marker of the same or similar color to fill it in. If you're using black, you can use a larger brush pin. You can also use a bottle of ink for that. It's gonna be more economical and it's also gonna save you a lot of time. So that's what the two tips look like compared to each other. We have our brush tip and we have our fixed width tip. So just to compare the usage of the two, these tend to be great if you're drawing inorganic things like buildings and you don't necessarily want a lot of line weight variation because you're not really gonna get a lot of line weight variation out of these. You can see it kind of tapers as my hand kind of starts to pull away. And people who are really good and have a lot of practice at using these can achieve a lot of variation in their line work. But what you're gonna find yourself doing is you're gonna find yourself kind of building up your line work by doing multiple lines in one area. And there's nothing wrong with that. I really want you guys to use the art supplies that you're comfortable with using. I'm not trying to make any of you feel like you're lesser for using what you like. I just wanna point out the differences. Now, I'm a big fan, like I said, of brush pens. You can get it to focus on it so you can get really fine lines. If you bear down, you can get really thick lines. You can tell I've used this one a lot because it is starting to railroad, split, and dry brush on me. That's not something you actually necessarily want. It can be used for effect, but in general, you want it to do a solid line more like that. So as you vary the line weight and the pressure, you can get a variety of line weights. Now these are often sold here in the US to brush letterers, to brush calligraphers. I really think, I mean, that they're a wonderful market. I'm not putting them down, but I really think it's a missed opportunity because comic artists, cartooning artists, animators, illustrators will also really enjoy these brush pins. And I just kind of feel like it's a shame not to market to them as well. Now, some people can go straight into their line art without any underdrawing. That is not me. So what I'm going to do is I wanna do a little bit of a head-to-head -head comparison to demonstrate the differences between the two types of inking tools for you guys. So I'm going to draw a couple of little faces and then I'm going to ink them with the red micron and with the red brush pen. So one really important thing for me with line consistency when I'm inking is controlling my breath. Pulling in with a breath or pulling out with a breath. So trying to pull my lines as I'm breathing, which means talking and inking don't go well together for me personally. That's when I tend to get really shaky lines. It's when I'm unable to pull a really nice long line. Another thing, you really wanna try not to ink from your wrist. You guys saw me doing a lot of small movements. 
you want to try using more of your arm when you're drawing and when you're inking. I have limited space right now, so it's a little more challenging, but just in general, that's something you're going to want to keep in mind. So I am going to start with the fixed width micron, and I'm also going to time myself as I'm inking to see how long it takes, and we'll compare the two for that as well. Now keep in mind, this is a preference. It is not a judgment call. I am not saying anything negative about people who ink with one or with the other. I have my own preferences, and if you haven't tried inking with the other, regardless of what your preferred inking method is, I really hope you'll pick one up and try it because one of the great ways to learn new skills, to learn new art techniques, is to try something new. So in real time, that took about four minutes and 50 seconds to ink. And I didn't do any kind of special techniques. I didn't shade anything in. I didn't do any cross hatching. It's just straightforward line art with some line weight variation. You guys saw me going over some areas multiple times in order to build up those heavier line weights. So next, we are going to try inking with the Tombo Furenosuke. And I do apologize for the shadow. I actually switched out my studio lighting recently and it's a little bit harsher than I'd like. So I do need to put a light filter on it because it does cause some cast shadows, but I'm working on that. I have not forgotten. So let's try inking with the brush pen next. So with the brush pin, I was able to ink this in three minutes and 30 seconds. To be fair, I am way more comfortable and in practice with brush pins than I am with microns, but it's still a lot faster because I can use just a bit of pressure to get a varying line weight rather than having to go over the same area multiple times. And you guys do see that I did have to go over some areas a couple of times. That's pretty normal, especially if you want really, really big bouncy line weights. Now, you can go up to larger brush pins like some of the ones that we were talking about earlier. Those do require quite a bit more motor control and finesse, something that sometimes I don't even have. And if you're really looking for like ultimate customiz 
customization. You can try inking with dip pins, with nibs, and with brushes. And I've got tutorials here on the channel to help you guys out with just that. But for today, we're learning how to make our own coloring sheets, AKA line arts. And all that is, is the basic outline of our illustration without the color. And then after we've removed the pencils. Before we dive into that, I do wanna share some tips for inking just to help you guys out a little bit. I try to draw everything in one brush stroke. I try to draw it as smoothly as possible and I am trying to use my whole arm. My hand does sometimes catch on the tabletop, sometimes bumps on other things. So if you're working in a smaller workspace, just keep that in mind, it is going to be more challenging. And friend, I see you. The friend who works on the bedroom floor on a clipboard. The friend who's drawing on their desk while at school. I see you, I get you, I've been there. Sometimes I'm still there. And you just gotta work with the constraints that you have. I do recognize and acknowledge that having a big, clear workspace that is dedicated for work is quite a luxury and a privilege. And it's one that many artists don't have. So friend, I get you. So another thing is I try to work from, I call it top to bottom or front to back. So I start with things that overlap other things like her hair and her bangs. I also draw the most important things early on while my hand is still fresh before it starts cramping up. And then I move on to the things that are less important, less noticeable. So like on her neck here, I realized it was a little bit thin where I had the line. I tried to make it a little bit wider, more natural, and I went a little too wide. So when you are working with alcohol markers, when you're working with watercolor, don't make corrections to your inks until after you've colored it because in some, you can kind of fudge where the line is or how it looks with color. Secondly, if you put your corrections down now, it's gonna be noticeable when you put color on top of it. It's gonna be a different shade. It's gonna be a different color. Whereas if you just try to work with it, it's gonna be a little bit more of a natural blend. And you know, sometimes you grow to like it. You grow to attach to it. Another thing is if you find yourself making mistake after mistake after mistake, and you're always making more and more corrections using whiteout or masking fluid or whatever, then not masking fluid, correctional fluid, sorry then it's going to change the surface of the paper. It's gonna make it choppy. It's gonna make it noticeable. If you're just doing line arts or just doing black and white, that's not a big deal. You can fix that digitally. But if you wanna color it later, save your corrections for the end. I promise friend, it is far less painful. For today's tutorial, I have some thumbnail sketches of possible coloring page ideas. I got them out in my sketchbook rather than trying to figure them out on the cardstock while I'm drawing. It's so much easier with these sort of light, almost stick figure kind of doodles to figure out your ideas and figure out what you want. And it's a lot quicker to redraw it than to start with this big elaborate idea and then erase, 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 and try to redraw it and redraw it and redraw it. This is so much easier. So if you've never tried doing quick little thumbnails a try. This is a great way to get your ideas out into the world. And my sketchbook is almost entirely just doodles like this, which is why I don't really do sketchbook tours anymore. So I have a few ideas that I think are really cute. I'm hoping to do at least a couple of them because we're going to use this for a blind grab bag three marker challenge. And I definitely want to have some options for things that might work well with what I already have. So for this, I'm going to use a mechanical pencil. That's just what I happen to like. It's what I'm more comfortable with drawing with. I don't like stopping and having to sharpen my pencil, but you can use whatever pencil you like to draw with and that you're most comfortable with. The number one thing though is it needs to be erasable, you know? You can use colored light if you like, you can use graphite if you like, but you do need to be able to erase it after you've inked it. I would also recommend you stay away from the softer, darker leads, just because sometimes when we're inking with these colored inks, they kind of stain underneath the drawing, as you guys can kind of see with some of the yellows and greens. After you color it, it's not as noticeable, but it's easier to get rid of it if you're using like an HB lead than if you're using a B or softer. 
So generally when I'm drawing, I'm not just drawing things off the top of my head. I start by doing some smaller thumbnail sketches to figure out concepts that I like and figure out which ones I actually want to focus on. I came up with several cute concepts for this tutorial. So I have those sketched out as thumbnails and I'm going to be drawing several of them for you guys. So I'm starting out with this illustration of the kawaii cacti and you guys saw that I laid down a quick compositional grid that's going to help me place the characters and then I very loosely sketch their rough forms and where I want their eyes and features to be before I go in and I refine everything. So I'm sketching this kind of tight mainly because this is for a tutorial. I want you guys to kind of see what I'm doing and see my thought process. I think it's fun to be able to share some start to finish art with you guys. But generally, if I'm going to be inking something, I only draw in as much detail as I need for inking the piece. So for this one, I'm sketching it tighter for y'all, but generally for me, I don't necessarily put in all that time. The more you practice inking, the less you're really gonna need to do during your underdrawing because you're gonna be able to think while you ink. But while you're getting used to inking, while you're still becoming comfortable with it, you're gonna probably wanna draw it a bit tighter because that's gonna allow you to focus on the actual inking process rather than the drawing process. So they're kind of two different things, inking and drawing. They're both really important and there can be a lot of drawing while you're inking, but while you're still learning the actual physical process of inking, I find that it's better to work tighter with your illustrations rather than looser. I'm also sketching this with a pencil that is super comfortable in the hand because my arthritis is acting up. I'm using the Dr. Grip for this. I have a lot of mechanical pencil reviews here on the channel. So if you have grip issues as well, if you have difficulty holding a pencil or you find that you have a lot of hand fatigue, I hope you guys will check out my mechanical pencil reviews. And if you've ever found one that you found to be super helpful, thanks to my review, please do let me know. It really would mean a lot to me. So I'm going to work my way through several of these concepts. So now I'm drawing the cacti girl. So you guys saw that I laid down a composition grid to kind of figure out where I want everything and to help with placement. And then I do a rough sketch of everything. So you guys can see I roughly sketched in the basic three um, volumetric form for her head, the volumetric form for her neck. And I do have tutorials on volumetric drawing. I mean, you can learn how to draw basically anything with volumetric drawing. And I find that volumetric drawing is really great for people who struggle with drawing, who struggle with visualizing things in their head. That's definitely me. I would not be able to draw at all if it weren't really for volumetric drawing. So for me, it's like a savior and I will forever sing its praises. I mean, it's probably not for every artist. It's no, no one technique is for every single artist. But if you're struggling to kind of internalize drawing, if you have difficulty seeing things and holding that image in your head, using thumbnails and volumetric drawing can be a huge help. So once I had kind of the basic idea sketched out onto paper, then I go ahead and I move my thumbnails out of the way and I'm able to kind of focus on refining the shapes and sketching everything in. So since she is a cactus girl, I definitely wanted that to be apparent without being too overwhelming. I'm sure it is too overwhelming. So I drew a prickly pear blossom and her braids are actually the, the cactus spikes. And then her buns are just two little short, cute cactuses. I also want to point out that I do draw very quickly, but all of these have been time lapsed by about 8x. So these are really sped up. I don't know that anybody draws quite this fast, but I do draw very quickly. And part of the reason is I'm 35. I've been drawing, I mean, every most artists have been drawing since they were little kids, but I got serious about drawing at 13 and I was drawing comics every day and drawing all the time all through class and getting in trouble for it all the time but I also used to do a lot of anime conventions and the way I made the bulk of my money at anime conventions was doing at convention commissions which means you have to learn how to draw very quickly and you have to be able to draw consistently you have to be able to deliver 
a piece that people are happy with it looks like the examples in your example book so consistency and quickness is really important I'm able to whip out or I used to be able to whip out an inked sketch in about 45 minutes which is not bad at all and that was the only way I wasn't just completely swamped with commissions because that was one of the things I really enjoyed doing at conventions but it it is very difficult to actually make a profit doing convention commissions the way I was doing them so it's not something I would necessarily recommend to other artists but it did help build up my confidence I got very comfortable drawing with other people watching I got very comfortable with talking about my process I got very comfortable with drawing in kind of uncomfortable ways so people could better see what I was doing and it helped me learn how to draw very very quickly so I don't want you guys, if you don't draw that fast, I absolutely don't want you to beat yourselves up for that. That is not the takeaway at all. It's more me explaining how I'm able to draw as quickly as I am able to draw. But that's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just, it was a necessity for the type of work I was doing at the time. I also, as I've mentioned in so many of my tutorials, I tend to have a very simple cartoony art style. I'm going even more simple and cartoony for this since these are coloring sheets that I'm going to use in some of my classes. So I'm really thinking about like coloring book illustrations. And while some do have very complex, very detailed lines, art some of them are just very simple large areas to color that you can just kind of relax into and that's what I was going with I was going with what would I enjoy coloring because we're going to be using these for an upcoming three marker challenge and I wanted to have a variety of pieces so I could fit one that would suit the colors that I had as well as possible and um, I also wanted stuff that I would have fun coloring so you guys can see, I usually will use kind of a stick figure underdrawing to help me place where all the elements are going to be. So if you struggle with your heads are always off the page or your feet are always off the page, doing a stick figure pose of what you want to draw first helps you get your art onto the page, helps you get the idea on the page. So you're not dealing with just a white page and how to conquer that white page. You've already got some ideas out on the page. It also helps with placement and for me it helps me draw more interesting poses because I can use this stick figure to pose it first before I have to imagine the rest of the body and I've mentioned this in so many of my tutorials but I'm going to mention it again because it's a game changer for me I'm utilizing volumetric drawing principles seeing everything as a three-dimensional object and breaking it down to the most simple version of that object and then adding detail from there and I have tutorials on how you can learn how to draw anything I'm a big believer that art is accessible if, if you can if you got if you can see you can probably learn how to draw and I want to make that accessible for as many people as possible so I've got some great very simple tutorials on using volumetric drawing to draw a variety of things from ob everyday objects to animals to people and I even have tutorials on how you can use those to draw comics so I really want to make art as accessible as possible So now I have four potential illustrations to ink and use for the three color challenge. And there's a lot of graphite on here. I tried to keep everything really loose because generally the way I work now is I do a lot of my tightening up while I'm inking. But while you're still getting used to inking, while you're still getting used to putting your thoughts on the paper using ink, I recommend you pencil everything really tight, get all the details that you're going to want on there, and then ink on top of that. But I'm going to try to ink all four of these. My deadline is before tomorrow, so I got to get them done tonight. So that's why I say try. I do think they all turned out pretty cute. And if the inks turn out cute as well, I'll make these available to my patrons as printable coloring sheets. So if you like my art, you think it's cute and you'd like to color along, you guys can find me at patreon.com slash natosoup. So generally, I would ink with the brush pins I showed you guys earlier. That's my preference. But when I'm teaching, I do try to use the same materials I have my students using. That way, I can kind of walk them through any problems they might be having. I also think it's unfair for a teacher to use better materials than the students have access to. You're, in my opinion, kind of setting them up for failure. So these are good. While they wouldn't be my preference since I do prefer brush pins, they are pretty good. 
Um, I do wish I had a wider color gamut though, at least a pink, but we'll make do with what we have here. So as you guys probably know, graphite, as you run your hand across it, has a tendency to smear. I'm not a big fan of that, so I just use a regular sheet of copy paper as a buffer between my hand and the paper itself. And we have lots of colors to choose from, but that, man, that lack of a pink and yellow is just like throwing me because it's that's the colors I really want for this, so I will... Like I said earlier, make do the best I can with what I've got. So when I'm inking an illustration, I usually work with a sheet of copy paper between my hand and what I'm trying to ink. That helps prevent me smearing the graphite all over the place. It also helps prevent me from smearing the ink all over the place because if you guys have ever rested your hand in wet ink, you guys will know it'll smear, it'll stamp all over the page. So this buffer sheet will help absorb still wet ink without smearing it. It also protects the page from the oils on my hand. Everybody has oils on their hand hands. Um, I even have very dry hands and I keep my hands really clean and I still like to work with a buffer sheet whenever possible just to help prevent dirtying up the page, smearing my pencils, smearing my ink. So this is just a sheet of copy paper. It's not anything special or expensive. And for this, I'm using, you know, fixed width felt liners. So um, you guys might hear these referred to as technical pens. You might hear them sometimes referred to as felt tip pens. You might hear them referred to as art pens. You might hear them referred to as fixed width pens. All of these are true. So uh, technical pens were originally used for technical illustration. So um, like product design or um, architecture or even for lettering. So they were used a lot back uh, in at when advertising was done more on paper with pens and markers and watercolors. Uh, they're still very useful. They're still very helpful. A lot of comic artists, a lot of illustrators like them. You guys remember at the top of the video though, I said I do prefer brush pens, but these are very helpful even when lettering, like a lot of hand lettering done in comics is done with technical pens. Uh, rapidographs are the predecessor to these. Those have, oh boy, those are a whole nother animal and they're much more difficult and finicky to use. So I would say let's be grateful that we do have technical pens like this available. I refer to them as fixed width pens because you know when you get a size eight, it is always gonna put, or it's almost always gonna put a size eight width line down. It's always gonna be a consistent size. You can change how you hold it and get a slightly thinner line. You can hold it really lightly and you can get kind of a lighter skippy line and uh, you can really mash down on it and ruin it and get a thicker line for a little while. But generally it's going to produce a consistent line no matter how much pressure you put on it. So that's why I refer to them as fixed width lines. Now, if you wanna get a thicker line, you can either switch to a larger version of this. So I'm using a, a size five, which is 0.45 millimeters. It's got a super teeny tip, but not nearly as teeny as it can get. If I wanted a heavier line, I might wanna switch to an, an eight which is like, I think 0.75 millimeters, or you can go over the same line several times. And that's one of the reasons I don't really like these kind of inking pins personally. While you're just getting used to inking, while you're building up your hand control, while you're building up your line control, they can be very helpful. But for me, I find them to be very tiring because there's a lot of repetitive strain from going over the same areas again and again. So the big trick with these is going to be patience. I highly recommend you let the inks cure. That allows the pigments to bond to the paper. I recommend you let them cure for at least 12 hours. Let them sit overnight, no less than 10 minutes. An hour is usually good too, but the longer you can let them sit, you know, up to a day, the less smearing you're gonna see. Another thing to keep in mind is when you're coloring these, if you're using alcohol markers, if your alcohol markers are running dry, they're going to smear your inks regardless. So make sure your markers are topped up and juicy before you color this. And thirdly, I guess thirdly, I don't know, I lost track, but um, make sure you do erase your graphite 
after you've finished inking it. If you're using colored lead, that's more hit or miss. You guys know I do a lot of lineless work using colored lead, so I do think they don't affect alcohol markers as negatively as graphite can. Graphite can really ruin your alcohol markers, which is why I recommend you don't ink on top of it. But when I'm going to erase this, I'm gonna use a white vinyl eraser. You could also try using a gum eraser like this one here for this, but you wanna avoid using an eraser that's got a lot of grit to it. So those pink pearl erasers are not really a great fit for something like this. So for these illustrations, I wanna do colored line arts. I, I recently found out that there are some hot opinions on colored line art. So I'm just gonna say, I like them. I think they add a lot of vibrancy to your art. They are not an end all be all solution, but they can be a fun solution. So I'm in favor of them. I'm working with a limited color selection with this pin set. There's only, I think five colors in here. I'm missing a pink, I'm missing an orange or a yellow, and those would be super helpful in this instance, but I'm working with what I've got. So generally when I'm doing colored line art, I try to think about my colors as my local color. So that's what the color would appear to be my highlight color. So I might want to go with a lighter color to ink there and then my shadow color. So I might want to go with a darker color to think there, uh, to ink there. And, um, with this, I don't have as many colors as at my disposal. So I'm really just thinking in two colors. I'm mostly thinking in the local color and then I'm thinking in the shadow color. So for the prickly pear blossom in her hair in my head, it's going to be magenta and yellow. I don't have either of those colors. So I'm using brown for the center where the yellow is going to be. And I used purple for the outline of the flower rather than red because purple is more similar to a shadow color for magenta than the red would be. But I'm using the red for her eyelashes and her lips because for that, I'm thinking like a bright, hotter pink. So in that instance, it would be closer to a red than to say to a purple. Now, it's totally okay if you don't end up using those colors. You can re-ink it later. You can sometimes just not even re-ink it and the markers that you apply on top of it will kind of help adjust those colors. So don't stress out if you end up going with a different color. You can always ink on top of it later. We're really just kind of going for close enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. There's no such thing as perfection. So please don't beat yourself up when trying to go for perfection. So when I'm inking, generally I use a heavier line weight, a thicker line towards areas that are in shadow underneath other objects closer to the viewer. So you can really use a heavier line weight to imply several different things. You can use it to imply importance to the viewer. You can use it to imply a weight. So you might use a heavier line weight on a rock than with a feather where you might use a really light, delicate, sometimes skippy line weight. Um, you can also use it to imply where the light is hitting. So at the top of an object, you might have a lighter, thinner line weight, whereas at the bottom, you're gonna have a thicker, thicker, heavier line weight implying shadow. So inking is actually a lot of fun. There's a lot of thought, a lot of art that goes into inking. It's not just, I remember when I was in school, like in high school, and I was making comics in class, and uh, this guy in my class was kind of like trying to get a rise out of me and I was inking my own art. And he was like, so you mean you're just tracing it? And I, at the time I was just tracing it because I really didn't know a lot about inking. I was still using ballpoint pins to ink my art, which if you do that and it works for you, that's great. It was not working for me. It's just what I had access to. So I kind of was just tracing my art, but like, no, inking is not just tracing your art. You're adding a lot of thought to it. You're adding a lot of information as you're inking. Inking is a really important part of the process should you choose to use inking in your toolbox. So there's a lot more to inking than tracing the art. And I'm not, I'm not like salty at him for thinking that. I think that's actually a pretty common line of thought. I think a lot of people who are professional inkers have to deal with that as well. But there's a lot more to inking than just going over somebody else's line art. And sometimes when you're a professional inker and you're inking somebody else's pencils, what they give you isn't even finished art. You're the one deciding where the shadows go. You're the one deciding how to render the hair. There's a lot of thought that some inkers are going to have to put into the art when they receive it.
I have a lot of inking tutorials here on the channel where I show you guys how to use different materials, whether it's dip pins and nibs or brushes or brush pins. I have a lot of tutorials. So if you're interested in learning more about inking, and honestly, I think you should, it's a lot of fun. It adds a lot to your art. It's well worth understanding and studying. I've got you covered here on the channel with my advanced inking techniques playlist. And I also have a brush pins playlist. So I'll be sure to link those down in the description below for you guys. But really the focus is talking about how to take your art, how to ink it, and how to use this as coloring sheets, how to think about creating coloring sheets. So here on the channel, when I'm doing alcohol marker tutorials, often I will go ahead and scan my line art and share that with my patrons as, you know, just like a thank you bonus. And I'll also put it up on Gumroad in case people want to buy it and color along with my tutorials. So what's really important to me when I'm inking is to make sure I erase the pencils completely and cleanly. I don't want graphite to be remaining and to get a really good scan of the art and then color correct it. So like I said earlier, I do a lot of colored line art. I really like colored line art. I make two versions of my line art available. I have a color version that you can print out and color using a toner printer, or you can print out the black and white version again using a, a toner printer. So toner inks are going to be alcohol marker safe. You can use your Copics, you can use Prismacolors on top of toner printed images. They're also water safe or waterproof. So you can water, if you print it on a watercolor paper, you can paint that as well. So I do mention that when I am distributing my color coloring pages that that's what I would recommend. I mean, I also encourage people to try out new things, to try out the blue line technique, to try printing it with water soluble inks and going for a lineless technique, but I can't guarantee results for that. But with the toner printer, I can guarantee that you should be able to marker and you should be able to watercolor on top of it. So. Um, I would love to see if you ever have printed out one of my line arts and you've colored it. I'd love to see what you do with it. I'm always curious about how people choose to color things and what choices they're making when they're coloring things. So I use a large format scanner for pretty much everything, but you don't have to. You could even take it down to the library and just Xerox it. So long as your original art, you've really removed all the graphite, there's no smudges, there's no dirt on it, you should be able to get a nice clean copy that you can reproduce and you can either give it away or sell it. You know, you can do what you want with it. In this tutorial, I'm not really gonna talk about creating this for online sales or generating online sales of your line art. I apologize if that's what you were looking for. That's not really an area I, fo I mean, I do offer them for sale, but I don't really push them. I don't really advertise that. It's more of just a bonus, uh, almost like a passive income because I'm making these illustrations anyway for me to color and I figure people might wanna color along. So for me, what I'm really advertising is the class aspect, the color along, the learn along with me aspect rather than the, hey, this is a coloring sheet, this is a coloring book, this is a line art that you can print and purchase. So I don't necessarily have a lot of experience with um, the advertising aspect of that. Like I couldn't tell you how to do that on Etsy. And that's not really my goal here. My goal here is just to kind of, you know, this can be a fun, add-on if you're an artist and you have a patreon like i said i use that on my patreon it's just like a little extra bonus thank you incentive um it can be useful if you're a teacher and you want to create your own activity sheets or you want to have them practice certain techniques so you want to control the subject matter that they're coloring it can also be a great exchange activity where one person does the line art and somebody else does the color and collaborating like that is an important part of this industry it's a great way to build friends it's a great way to learn new things because when you're coloring somebody else's art you're going to learn a lot about their thought process and it's going to kind of force you to get out of your comfort zone and to think outside the box that you're used to thinking in and it's going to teach you different skills so it's a really great activity that has a lot of artistic merit to it. So um, hopefully that was helpful. But I also just kind of wanted to share my thought process on how I create these sort of images, how I go ahead and ink these sort of images. And I wanted to make this something that was accessible to more people who might just be interested in doing it for fun, who might be interested in doing it as just a hobby, um, not necessarily as a massive source of income.
well, we have completed four different line arts. So we have our cactus girl. We've got our kawaii cacti. We've also got our little frog friend in the rain. And then we have this cutie here. And I tried to do slightly different things for a couple of them. So for this one, I left it with just a black line art with just a couple of highlights, like the red for the cheek blush. And this way, it kind of doesn't matter what colors I use. It'll still work with this. For this, I really, really wish I'd had some yellow or a pink. Um, because for the jumper, or rather for the Macintosh, I'm using the brown. An orange would have worked well for that as well. So generally, when you're picking your color for your line art, when possible, you want to go one step cooler or darker than what you're actually doing, unless it's a highlight, and then you want to go one step maybe warmer and brighter, kind of depending on what you're doing. It it's a your mileage may vary sort of situation, but we didn't really have a pink or a yellow or an orange, so we really had to make do with what we had. And that's okay because one of the things about this when you're coloring it is you can actually, you can really honestly go with whatever colors you like for it, and then you can re-ink it later on. So it's not the end of the world. But the thing about this is I am sure there are areas in these line arts where I need to go back in, clean things up, maybe add a darker line like on her. I'm looking at the neck and it could probably benefit from a slightly heavier line. The same on her cheek here. So generally what I would recommend is go ahead, let it dry overnight, erase it and then come back. And if you wanna bump up the line width in places, you'll have a better idea of what you're working with and what it really needs to look its best. So I know I keep picking at it, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to come back to it tomorrow, use my soft white vinyl eraser to erase all the graphite and then go in and see where it would benefit from. A little bit of extra line art. I can't get rid of anything, I can't erase anything, I can't change anything, but sometimes by bumping up the line art or changing where the shadow is, like with the glasses here, I was really struggling because honestly, I've inked all of these. So I've been inking for like four hours now. Don't be me. I have taken breaks, but my hand is like, okay, no more. And by the time I was inking her glasses, my hand was really pretty shot. So I was having trouble kind of mimicking or doing symmetry. So I used a darker shadow underneath to kind of even things out a bit because one rim was a little narrow, one was a little thick. So the one that was a little narrow, I added the shadow underneath. The one that was sick, I actually went in and kind of, you know, whittled it down a little bit using shadow. But I look forward to seeing how these look tomorrow once we've erased all our graphite. So these have had a chance to dry for about eight hours. I'm gonna go ahead and use my white vinyl eraser to remove the graphite. So if you want to prevent ghosting and smearing as much as possible, you will be a little bit more delicate than I'm going to be. I just don't have the time necessarily to be as gentle as I'd like. But, you know, best case scenario, best working conditions, you wanna erase very gently. Let me show you. And while this isn't necessary, I find having a drafting brush like this one is really helpful for removing that eraser schmutz and letting you see how much graphite is still on the page. This thing was like $10 15 years ago and I use it like every day. So this is a one-time investment, unless you lose it, that is really useful. And it's one of those things I think a lot of artists don't think they need, but once they've tried it out, they love it. So as I'm erasing the graphite from these, I'm also going back and in some areas, I am kind of just bumping up the thickness on the line art. So this can be used to, you know, denote a lot of different things. It can be used to kind of indicate that something is more important because it's have it has a heavier line art. It can make it look like it is closer to the viewer. It can also be used to imply that it's got a bit of a cast shadow. It's really all in how you use it. I'm also kind of going back and making sure that any lines that I might want to be connecting lines are connecting. And occasionally I'm just going in and adding in some additional details as well. So I use this stage as a chance to kind of refine 
the artwork to kind of tighten it up. And generally this would be a little bit easier with the brush pins. These inks wouldn't take as long because like I showed you guys earlier, we could get it, you know, done one and done basically. You don't have to go over the same line six times in order to get that line weight you want. But I know for a lot of artists, these technical pins are a little bit more accessible. They're easier to find for some artists. They're um, just something that seems like they would be easier to use. So I know a lot of artists who are maybe not as comfortable with traditional media, this is what they would grab or it's what they grew up with. It's what they're familiar with. It's what they know. So I'm not necessarily putting it down. I'm not condemning them. It's just more my own personal preference in general would be towards brush pins. I find those a little bit easier to use. And this is a bit of a time consuming process going back and kind of tightening things up and fixing it. But I think it's well worth it because I think it makes the end result look a lot better. So that's why even if I'm not super satisfied with the first pass that I make when I'm inking, I don't get too hard on myself because I know I'm going to go back in and I'm going to fix a lot of the stuff that might have been bothering me. So one of the things I do like to do is I like to bump up my line art when it's crossing in front of another object. And that just kind of helps create a little bit of definition and delineation. And I find that that's particularly helpful in coloring pages that I'm going to sell on Gumroad or that I'm selling as, you know, coloring packs or that I'm sending out to my patrons because, you know, I know what's going on in my head, but I want to telegraph what's going on so that they, you know, they can follow along too. And it's not like you're just looking at this line art and you're like, okay, I'm not super sure what to do with that. Another thing is I'm going to scan these after I've finished inking them. I have a large format scanner that I like to use, but it for this size, this is just on, you know, cardstock. So it's like uh, eight and a half by 11. So it's letter size. So it's a smaller standard size. You don't need a large format scanner for this. You don't need an expensive scanner for this. You can also head down to your local library and ask them if they would scan it for you. Uh, many libraries are willing to do that. The difficulty is sometimes in finding someone who knows how to use the scanner. And you guys will also notice that as I'm inking, even as I, I'm re-inking, I'm twisting and turning the paper to get the best angle for what I want to ink. And this is really important. This is going to save your wrist a lot of fatigue. It's going to save your wrist a lot of strain. And it's something that um, in my painting tutorials, I don't really, and many of my drawing tutorials, I don't demonstrate often because I know that it can give people motion sickness to see me twisting and turning the paper all that much. But it really is beneficial. And um, I do end up with a lot of repetitive wrist strain because I don't do it as often as I should just because YouTube does have some limitations, you know. You, you are really often trying to get the shot that's best for the viewer rather than the angle that's best for you as an artist. So this is one of those instances where it's kind of do as I recommend, <laughs> not do as you see me do but it is pretty important. And then I go back and I look at it again and sometimes there's areas where I can see just a little bit of graphite. I wanna make sure I remove those, especially if I'm going to be sharing this as a scan later because while I can remove some of that digitally in Photoshop, it's a little bit annoying to have to do that and it's nice to just be able to work from as clean a scan as possible. Another thing I do when I am sharing these, when I'm, you know, putting them on Gumroad or I'm sharing them on my Patreon is I like to have two versions available. Not everybody has a color printer. Not everybody wants to use color to do line arts. Like that's my preference, but I know some people have actually some really strong negative opinions about color dot line art, which I don't really understand, but Okay, um, sure, that's, we all have our own path. Um, so I do like to have a black and white version available and that's great for my patrons who are teachers and they might be printing out several for their students. It's a little bit more economical. So I'm on a bit of a short leash since I need to leave for Art Squad soon, but I was able to erase and correct three of these and erase, but not yet correct the final one. I'd hope to get all four of them done before I left. I was really hoping I could scan them too, but 
sometimes things just take longer and you know it's okay that good things take time so you guys can see i bumped up the line arts on these i cleaned up the eyes a little bit i bumped up the line art significantly in some areas here and then i bumped up the line art particularly on the hair for this one and then for this one i really want to clean things up uh, i lost a lot that I wasn't able to see with the graphite. So I need to go back over it with the black pin and bump up the line art, probably separating her braids from the rest of her hair, maybe adding some shadow under the flower, that sort of thing. So here are my five finished line arts. My next step is to go ahead and scan them. That way I can sell them online or offer them to my patrons. To me, the scanning is pretty simple and I do have some tutorials where I walk people through that. So I'm not gonna cover that here. You can also just take them to like Office Max, Office Depot or your local library and see if they'll photocopy them for you onto cardstock. And that way you could sell your line arts as, you know, a physical form. I've done that at shows as well. So I'm really looking forward to coloring at least one of these during the three marker challenge. And I really look forward to being able to share these with my fantastic patrons over on Patreon. So if you want to color along, if you think these are cute, if you join me now on Patreon, you'll get all of these for no additional cost, plus loads of great tutorials and access to my class materials because I do teach comic and drawing and watercolor and alcohol marker classes both online and in person and the best way to get a hold of that is to either take a class with me or to join me over on patreon so i hope you guys found this helpful useful and informative i'm looking forward to seeing you guys again really soon and if there's anything you're curious about learning how to do anything you'd like to try out that you don't know how to do please let me know down in the comments below so i hope you guys have a wonderful day and i hope to see you guys again really soon bye guys